Hi folks, backside chamfering. Let's show four different tools you can use to chamfer the backside of your parts, maybe save you from having to do that extra setup and how to go through the Fusion 360 speeds and feeds and cam setup. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. four different tools we can do this with. Again, the end goal is to chamfer the backside of our part in the same setup. Card here to the NYC CNC site where you can download this Fusion 360 file. We've got each of the tools and its cam operation set up. And in the tool library, we've labeled each tool with all of the relevant information tool description, the vendor, and an actual URL so you can find out more about that. And let's walk through those four tools. The first tool is a dedicated back chamfer tool. It's carbide, it means it's stiffer, and it's got a very reduced shank, which means it's easy to reach it into smaller profiles, but also if you're going to backside chamfer a small diameter hole. That's awesome. This is the tool that we used in the Wednesday widget on making the two gears. And you saw there just how small of a profile I wanted to sneak that tool into. Cam for the first tool, relatively straightforward. I selected my bottom edge. By the way, the trick to selecting a single edge and not all four at once is to hold the Alt key. And under passes, these look like peculiar numbers. So let's take these back to zero and take a look at what we've got. With no radial offset and no axial offset, we run a simulation, take a look at what's happening. The tip of the tool is tangentially kissing the very edge that we selected. Great, so to walk that in to actually create a chamfer, under passes, I'm gonna say radial stock to leave negative 0.01. Click OK, simulate, perfect. We're cutting a chamfer but I don't want the tip of the tool to be coplanar with the bottom of my part because there's a good chance that's gonna leave a pretty nasty mark. So we need to offset it down a little further. And with a 45 degree tool, it's one to one. So let's say I wanna push the tool 10 thou lower. All I do is add that same amount to my radial stock to leave. Click OK, simulate. Perfect. Now I'm gonna have a cleaner blend or not raise a burr as I'm running that chamfer tool across. Let's take a quick look at some math though. If we want to run a 10 thou chamfer, good old high school geometry, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the hypotenuse is actually 0 0.0071. So what I mean by that is, right now I programmed a 10 thou effective radius. So that's the radial stock minus the axial stock means it should be a 10 thou chamfer. But what do we mean by 10 thou? That's where this sketch comes in handy. There's a 10 thou chamfer. The issue is that the distance we need to offset is here to here, which is the 0.0077 thou, which again, we proved out here, which makes it easy to calculate. So if you don't want to go and create unnecessary sketch geometry. So let's start from scratch on our stock to leaves. We want a negative 0.007 thou chamfer, but to make that happen with some offset, I've got to also take out negative 10 thou, and that 10 thou there is the same number I need to put right here. Click OK. Now, if we run our simulation with our sketch on, you can see that our tool is perfectly intersecting that CAD sketch geometry, which gives me some confidence in what we're doing. I will say, uh, we'll talk more at the end of this video, there are a couple of caveats about backside chamfering when it comes to tolerances and, and stacked tolerances. But let's move on for now. Next tool is not a back chamfer tool, but it's a tool that you're more likely to maybe have laying around the toolbox already. It's a thread mill. 
Problem with this is it's 60 degrees and not 90. For a lot of us, if it's just a small five or 10 thou edge break chamfer, it may not matter. Downside is that some of these are a larger diameter, so it's gonna require a larger hole or area to clear it, and there's less back relief for clearance, and they tend to be more expensive. So it's not the perfect tool, but again, good chance you've already got one in the shop. Also, their carbide, very stiff. Thread mill, largely the same process. Couple of caveats, your stock to leave formulas aren't gonna be quite the same because it's a 60 degree tool. Most thread mills are, at least in the US, are 60 degrees. And I would say, instead of worrying about math, just eyeball it. We take a look here, you can get an idea of what that chamfer is going to look like. Again, because it's 60 degrees and not 90, it has a shallower angle. The big difference here is that unfortunately, we cannot use an actual thread mill for 2D contour fusion, just doesn't let you, I wish they did. So we need to make it as a form tool. How do we do that? Hop back into model, thread mill as a form tool. We'll turn that on, make it active. It's pretty simple. We created a sketch and we put in the dimensions of that thread mill. So for example, I know this was a 0.388 diameter cutting tool. So that gave me my 194 radius. We know it's 60 degrees and we know that's 150 degrees. So we get this profile view of the tool. We then go into cam. Let's turn that sketch light bulb on. Manage, form mill, shouldn't it be form tool? I think, you could, I think you can use these in the lathe environment. Tool profile, I like to click on the same point to select that profile. So I'm gonna click on the bottom cutting edge right here. Tool axis, I'm gonna click on the center line of the tool. I found, and for whatever reason, uh, generally you do have to flip the tool axis. So I click flip axis, which points the arrow down. And then compensation point, this is important. I'm gonna click that edge. And I thought that that meant we would have to measure the tool over on our height gauge to that point, but you don't. Fusion actually takes that height into account. Uh, and I can show you that by going into the tool library and editing the form tool that we just made. And under cutter, you can see the tip offset is automatically already calculated. So that's really important. And we've got our cutting diameter and you can see with the little red cross that's showing the compensation point. This is where you gotta just be careful, take your time, test, do not start back chide chamfering uh, for your first time ever on a really expensive you know, titanium part. You wanna, you wanna give it some practice and make sure, especially with the compensation points that your simulation is correct and that the machining, it's one of those rare caveats that your machining matches what you see in the simulation. Third tool is a high speed steel dovetail cutter, but works fine for backside chamfering. And the benefit here is 21 bucks, relatively inexpensive. Doesn't have quite as long as a reduced shank length, so you're not gonna be able to backside chamfer, say a one inch long part. And it's got six flutes, so you're gonna be able to go at a decent inches per minute feed rate. I thought this would be relatively straightforward. In fact, this tool, 97, you are able to correctly model as a dovetail cutter in the tool library, and that works with 2D contour. So I thought, hey, this will be pretty easy. Just like the first tool, we just do our radial and axial sock to leave. In fact, it's identical. And sure enough, the simulation looks like it should cut. Now, I don't have a good answer for you, but it didn't cut. So I left this in here saying did not cut. And what we had to do was adjust it. In fact, what I was doing was a top edge test to confirm I had everything right here, where we were running it light, literally right along the top edge. Uh, I'm hesitant to blame anything but my, myself as the operator, but I was playing around with that. One thing that's worth noting is you can have stack tolerance variances. If you mismeasure the height of the tool ever so slightly, that can have an effect. And tools are not perfect. They're machined or ground within a certain tolerance or spec, and even mistakes happen. And this is a $20 high-speed steel tool. There's a chance it's not perfect. In fact, I doubt these are made in the USA, yeah, Japan. So that's not a great explanation. This trick was to just reduce the radial offset a little, and that pushes the tool further in, but I don't like the idea that you're not getting exactly what you thought.
now I had to create a new, hopefully a final fusion off. I programmed this to make a bigger chamfer than we want, but I'm thinking that it's not machined to chamfer correctly, so maybe this actually undercuts the program chamfer and ends up being what I actually effectively want. And lastly, Mari Tool double angle chamfer cutter. Again, you might have one of these around. This is fun for me. You'll see why here later in the video. This kind of brings back some memories. Nice thing is it's a dual purpose. We were using it to cut Picatinny rail grooves, but you can also use it to chamfer the top side of your part or the bottom side. High speed steel, relatively inexpensive. Sufficiently long shank that is smaller than the cutting diameter. So it should be pretty easy for most parts to reach down to get far enough for that backside chamfer. Larger cutting diameter, so not gonna be the best choice for most uh, drilled hole diameters, but still a pretty good tool and one I would say you should keep in the toolbox. This tool also had to be modeled up as a form tool, no big deal. In some respects, in these situations where I want to see the perfect shank length and clearance, it's actually sort of easier to do it as a form tool. And because it's 90 degrees, same radial and axial stock here to give us a 10 thou chamfer. And there's our simulation. So this is awesome. I was going through the toolbox looking for a tool that I knew I had and take a look. Six years and two days to the date. January 28th, 2012, new Picatinny, tool number 125. This is how I got started, folks. We were manufacturing targets and that turned into manufacturing these camera mounts. And it was awesome. And it's funny because looking back, gosh, I was so green and I still feel green, but uh, it's really cool to see this and kind of feel uh, how far we've come. And for those of you that are out there looking to learn, whether it's job shop work or whether it's manufacturing entrepreneurship, that's what I'm focused on this year. The NYC CNC site, how to get started, how to find work, how to bring a product to market, card here to those videos. Three pieces of advice if you're going to start backside chamfering. Number one, again, test it and test it on a scrap part or something where the stakes are low in case you have a mistake. Number two, keep in mind chips still have to go somewhere. This really came to mind when we did, again, the dual gears in a past Wednesday widget. Chips need to be cut and then they need to be evacuated. If you've got a narrow slot or no clearance below the cutter, that could create a problem where the chips get recut, bad service finish, possibly even break the tool. And then number three, oftentimes when we program these tools in the tool library, Fusion defaults to a really slow plunge rate. That might be wise when you're getting started, but a lot of times I don't need to plunge at five inches a minute. You can bump that up to something like 20, 30, or even faster. Folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you next Wednesday.